situation and do something silly. Okay, so you can dance, okay, like this, and that's it. Okay, so you embarrassed yourself, and nothing I do from now on can be more embarrassing than what I did right now. So I'm free to talk about serious stuff now. Okay, I'm ready. We s we still have two minutes, so maybe we could dance a bit more. <laughs> I can <laughs> I can use those two minutes for a better uh, purpose. Um, okay, so. Mm. Oops. You have already met um, Vasily, and uh, he will be um, talking about extracting the UI from activity in the model view X approach. Yeah. Give him a big, uh, warm welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, thank you for the introduction and I'm very honored to be here as the biggest audience I had to date. So excuse me if I'm a bit nervous and also I hope, I hope my slides will come up. Um, is there any issue about with the slides? It was on like a minute before. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have some technical issue. Could you start the yeah. Oh. <laughs> Nobody breathes. Okay. So um, I came here to actually do try and convince you to extract all of your UI logic outside of activities and fragments. Uh, but to do that, I would like to tell you first about my own experience as an Android developer. Yep. Good. So when I decided to become Android developer, I bought a book. Okay, I will need to stand here that taught me basically what professional software developer needs to know. And then I read lots of the official documentation. And also our community is great at producing high quality blog content. So I read all that. And therefore, after several months, I looked at complete spaghetti code. Okay, So my fragments and my activities were like 500 plus lines of code line long, and some of them got to 1,000 already. And at the point where my first fragment got to 1,000 lines of code, I thought, well, that there must be a better way. No way, that's the best I can get. So I went on and Google for Android application architecture. And that's what I found. So we have Linux kernel, and then we have native libraries, and then we have application frameworks, and on top sits your application. Yeah, great. Really helpful. All right. So first page of Google results wasn't that helpful for me, so I kept looking for more content. And luckily, I found some. However, before I tell you what I did find then, uh, we need to talk about MVX architectural patterns. So what do I mean when I say MVX? Well, MVX is a family of architectural patterns for GUI-based frameworks. Several things to note here. First of all, it's a family. So we, are, we will be speaking, speaking about several different architectural patterns which nonetheless have something in common. Second, it's architectural pattern. It's not an architecture. Architecture is application specific. You can, usually you can't reuse your architecture. However, architectural patterns are high level patterns that you can reuse in different applications. And uh, the last part is GUI. So you need to have user interface in order to use one of the MVX patterns. And the main building blocks of any MVX pattern are basically model. So model contains states or business logic or data structures. Yeah, it's not really defined very well. And we have view, which contains user interface. And we have X, 
which contains flow control logic or business logic or state or data structures. It is very important that you note at this point that view is the only part that all implementations of different MVX patterns agree upon. We all agree that your UI logic should reside inside view component. However, if you take different MVX uh, representatives, they will not agree about what model is and what X is. And X will also have different names. Keep that in mind for now. Okay. So, when I wanted to find a better way to organize my application, I went and searched Google for a very long time, and fortunately I found this blog, which called Mind the Robot, and it was called by a guy named Yves Ivan. Uh, now he works for Oracle, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Ivan basically proposed this approach. He, he said, all right, let's separate our applications into three components, model, view, in controller. And that's not, not something new, right? This MVC pattern has been around for years. And let's make a view component activity. Okay, so activity is the view. And if you actually go and read that blog post, you will notice that what Ivan basically showed there is what we all use and call MVP today. So what Ivan called MVC, we call MVP today. Slight uh, change in implementation details, but it's the same exact pattern. But what is surprising about this blog post that I found is that it's, I don't know if you can see, but it's from 2010. So some developers think that all this MVX stuff began in Android like three or four years ago, but actually it began much earlier than that, and I'm not even sure that Ivan was the first one to start discussing these MVX architectures on Android. So it's very old concept, and the community, community, community members were working on MVX long before, let's say, official guidelines caught up with um, this effort. All right, uh, who does MVP today? Raise your hand. Okay, great. And I use this approach that I've been advocated for for a short time, and it was a tremendous improvement. Like all of you probably know who use MVP, you can have your UI logic outside, you have your controller or your presenter, which contains your flow control and business logic, and your model which contains either business logic or state. Very good, and it's much better than uh, what we have like officially recommended guidelines were back at the time. However, it wasn't good enough for me still. It felt clumsy, so I kept searching. And then I found this series of posts by uh, someone named Joshua Musselweasel, and I'm probably doing some disservice to his last name by mispronouncing it, but let's call it, let's keep it that way. So Josh wrote a series of blog posts, Josh found, he based his blog post on the one that we saw earlier by Ivan from 2010. So he found Ivan's work and kind of built on top of that and expanded his one single blog post into a series of nine different blog posts. So that was very, um, a very detailed description of MVC implementation on Android. And after several months of working with this approach, he basically wrote 10th post, and this post was activity revisited. So what Josh found out working with this approach is that there is something about activity which was not optimal with the standard MVC that he used before. And I will not even, uh, I will not overestimate the impact of what Josh found out because I do think that this realization of his is probably the biggest breakthrough in uh, architectural and design thinking for developing of Android applications. So what Josh said is that we have our model view in controller and the view is the activity for now. However, if you switch 
if you change your mind and you look at it from a different perspective, then it makes much more sense to have activity as the controller. So that's what Josh found out. That's what his tense blog post was about. He, he said, okay, I use this MVC for a while and I don't find it good enough. But if I switch roles or if I switch the role of the activity and make the activity controller, then I can work and it all, and it all checks out much better. Okay. And to understand why it all check out, checks out much better if you use activity as a controller in this pattern, we need to discuss what really the advantage of any MVX. Okay, who uses any kind of MVX? MVP, MVC, MVI, MVVM? Wow, well that will be probably around 50% of the audience or maybe even more. So what's the best, what's the best advantage of any MVX? It's not a rhetoric question, I ask you. Anyway, shout, what? <laughs> testing, all right. That's the first answer that I always get, testing. However, I do not agree with that completely. Please raise your hand if you use MVC and also do unit testing. Uh, MV, MVX, any MVX and also do unit testing. Well, that's, that's a lot of hands, very good, but it's still less than 50% that we had before. So some of you use MVX and don't do unit testing. Are you wasting your time? I don't think so. I think that testing is a byproduct. It's an advantage of MVX. However, it is derived from another advantage which is much bigger than done easier unit testing. And what I find to be the best advantage of any MVX is decoupling of the UI logic. And to do, to explain why I think it's the best advantage of any MVX, I need to actually define what UI logic means. So, for me, UI logic is the logic that actually draws the UI of the application. So that's the logic which is responsible for the layout uh, of the elements that the user sees and can interact with on the screen. And also, captures user inputs and uh, propagates them into the application. So UI logic does not handle user input, but it is responsible for capturing the user input and propagating it inside your application where it will be handled by other kinds of logic. So that's what I mean by UI logic. And if we go back to one of the first slides when we saw the definition of model view x something, Recall that view is really the only component that all implementations of MVX agree upon. So you can have very different interpretations of what model means. And you can have vastly different interpretations of what X stands for. However, all implementations agree that view should contain this UI logic, should encapsulate and hide the uh, details of UI logic from the rest of the application. Therefore, I can even say that once you extract UI logic inside your application into a standalone component, you decouple your UI logic from the rest of the application, you already fall into some MVX. You can always find M and you can always find X whenever you have your UI logic decoupled. And that's really the best advantage of any MVX approach. If you can achieve that, then the MVX will be beneficial for you. Why? Why is that? Why UI logic should be decoupled? Why not other logic? Maybe it's the model that is biggest advantage to decouple. No, I think it's UI logic and it is related to the fact that UI logic has very different characteristic from the rest of the application's logic. First of all, UI logic has the best requirements in the project. On most projects, uh, you have very partial requirements for the application, depending on the scale of the project, depending on the tools that you use, depending on the um, process that you use. You will have from zero documentation to let's say 50% documentation for the rest of the application. However, UI logic will 
probably always be defined very precisely because you cannot implement it otherwise. So you will always have these UI mockups that designers produce that you build your application upon. Second, usually UI logic will have much higher rate of change. So sometimes I worked on a project, on a greenfield project, that had two or even three iterations over UI, had different UI, even before the first user interacted with the application. And it's not going, it's not slowing down when the project becomes more, more mature, because when the project becomes mature, companies usually want to do A-B testing, and they usually want to do some kind of maybe rebranding, and stuff and optimize, for example, positions, colors, etc. of UI elements. UI logic is really unreadable. Okay, it's verbose, it's hacky, it's messy, it's a pile of poo. You can think about it a different way. From all other kinds of logic, you will usually be able to reverse engineer the requirements. So you read the definition, so you read um, yeah, the declaration of some class, and you can, if it was written properly, you will usually be able to infer what this class does. However, if I give you a bunch of UI logic, even if it's written very cleanly, you will not be able to reverse engineer the layout of the UI. And tools like uh, Layout Inspector and, and, and uh, um, automatic stuff can help. However, they do not capture all the details of the UI, like animations and stuff. So UI logic is unreadable. It's kind of one-way street. You write UI logic based on the requirements, but you will not be able to reverse engineer the requirements in most cases. And UI logic is the easiest to test manually because you just put your application up and you can interact with the screen and you can ensure that your logic behaves according to the specification and it's hardest to test automatically. Okay, so it will be very hard to really cover UI logic with tests. And I'm not talking about Espresso. Espresso is kind of low-hanging fruit. You can ensure that, for example, you have this button on the screen and when the user clicks the button, the the event that user clicked button is being passed into the application, but just try to imagine how would you write Espresso tests to, for example, verify the colors, the shapes, the relative positions of the ele elements on the screen, the animations, how, the animation, how animations look, the duration of the animations. All of this stuff is usually best left for uh, the human eye, for the manual testing. So these are the characteristics of UI logic that are really different from the rest of the application. Therefore, usually, usually UI logic is the best candidate from be, for being decoupled from the rest of the application. And if you have it coupled to some other part, then you will usually have a mess on your hands. Okay, said all that. Why not encapsulate and decouple UI logic while, while it resides inside activity? <clears throat> I will try to explain the problem with a specific example. Let's say that you have your UI requirements in the form of Envision or maybe uh, Zeppelin or PDF, whatever, and you want it to be decoupled. And by definition, decoupled means that UI logic, that some, something that is decoupled can be developed completely independently of the rest of the application. That's what decoupled means. If you can develop it independently, it's decoupled. If you need to know about other stuff, there is coupling. So if you combine those two things, your UI logic, basically the UI of your application, becomes the first candidate for being outsourced if you need to. For example, you might run late on a project and you want to get some help in, or you, or you have a hard time hiring where you, when you're located, so you would like to have some offshore developers help you with your project. So you will combine these two things and give that to some freelancer, and the freelancer will do a good job and produce for you this My Activity class, which encapsulates the UI that you wanted to have. And you can even assume that you gave the freelancer this interface, My View MVC, so the freelancer actually implemented what you wanted to, and assume that he did an outstanding job. That's the best developer on the planet. You know, you get a clean code, you get detailed requirements, everything is very good. So the question now is, would you take this activity as it is now and simply integrate it into your project? 
Who will do that? Great. Who will not do that? Who is afraid to raise his hand? OK. Uh, so yes, most of us feel a bit of uncomfortable about that, right? So we take activity from someone, just drop it inside your project, and it has all the UI. However, there's something more to it. And the whole picture is much more complicated than that, because activity, except for having UI logic in it, will also integrate with the life cycle. And freelancer has no means to know about all these things that you want to do in your own start. For example, you might want to have your analytics set up or something else. OK, activity will be integrated with other activities. So screens are interdependent. And if you want to implement some kind of navigation, then it will be usually handled inside activity. Runtime permissions, for some mysterious reason, they are coupled to activity as well. Loaders, integration with the loaders. Fragments, yep, coupled to activity, nice. Dependency injection, activity do not ha activities do not have uh, their constructor available. Therefore, you will usually use some kind of dependency injection library inside activities. Freelancer doesn't have any mean to know about your dependency injection setup. And much more stuff. So usually we have much more stuff in our activities than just UI logic. And Activities are GUT classes, OK? So this concept of GUT object that does too much and knows too much about the system, that's what activity is. Activities public API contains more than 100 methods. And the immediate implication of that is that if you put UI logic inside your activity, even if you do that very carefully, and even if you delegate all other responsibilities to other objects, it will be coupled to other responsibilities. It will not be fully decoupled. And that's really hard to change a mind and see it like that. However, if you iterate over this idea a bit in your head, it will eventually uh, sound very natural. Because we do feel, we do know that with, from our everyday um, development experience. However, we are very accustomed to think about activity as UI container. However, once you start thinking about the other responsibilities that activity has, you will very quickly arrive to this conclusion that activity knows too much and does too much. All right. So, very, no, no, not, very, not very positive thing to say, right? We are, we are writing our applications, and we put our logic into God classes, and we can't even work around that because we need to use activities. So the question now, can we do better than that? And the answer is yes, luckily. <clears throat> we can actually extract all the UI logic from the activity and make it truly decoupled from the rest of the activity's responsibilities. And it's actually not that hard. So that's, that's what we start with. We have our activity that implements this interface and UI logic resides inside. That's what we, you probably have if you use MVP approach. First of all, activity will not implement this interface anymore. There will be another standalone class completely new Java class that will implement this interface. Then we take all the UI logic and simply move it to this new standalone class. And then we can make activity, instead of implementing this interface, we can make it depend on this interface and contain an instance of this class and reference and delegate all the UI responsibilities to it. And once we do that, once we extract all the UI logic from the activity, we will clearly see that activity is the controller, or X, whatever you want to call it. So what, 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 what's the common denominator between all activities? Between Hello World project and the most complex project you, you, you've been working on, like what are the responsibilities that will be common to both of them? That's not a rhetoric question either. 
So what is the responsibility that is common to all activities? The simplest project. Okay. I, I don't agree with that layout of financial, but it's close. It's close. No, no, no. On create, right? Even the most simplest uh, hello world will have on create in order to bind, not inflate, but to bind some layout to the activity. So all activities will need to handle life cycle. However simple they are or however complex they are. And if you think about that, life cycle is not related to user interface. Life cycle is a feature of the framework that controls the, con the is basically flow control of the system to manage different components. And if you take your UI logic outside of your activity, you will clearly see that activity's responsibility, the main activity's responsibility, is really to handle the life cycle. And this concept is not new, okay? So Joshua Block in his effective Java, rule number 16, if I'm not mistaken. So that's what he said, favor composition over inheritance. If you put your UI logic inside activity and implement this uh, view MVC interface, you basically do inheritance. If you extract it out and then depend on this interface, you do composition. So this concept of extraction and uh, into standalone classes is really nothing new. And some of you who do unit testing probably already think that something here is problematic, right? Because we want our presenters or controllers or X, we want them to be independent of the activity in order to unit test them. And the thing is that um, when I talk to people, I think there's some misconception. Model view X or whatever you call it, does not prescribe to have one single class for each component. These are not classes. These are components. So there is really no problem with making your controller composite as well. So you can always extract this extra class to make uh, your code more testable. And unfortunately, you will need to do so. Okay, so that's the general approach that I've been using probably around since I get, got into Android development on many projects, and it works very well. And I would like to just to show you how it works on the API level. You will have this kind of my view MVC interface, and it will have this bind products. Okay, so that's, you bind some data structure to this view, and the external clients do not know what this class will do with these data structures. The, the, the details of how the view will render these data structures are completely obscured. And on the other hand, it has this listener interface and register and unregistered listener, so it's observable. And the activity will implement this interface and register itself with this view MVX, if you want, to get notified about this event on by clicked. So this view clearly has some kind of a button, and when the user clicks on this button, he wants to buy what he wants to buy. Well, probably this same product. And even though this method is called clicked, there is nothing that enforces that we, we are talking about click or a button. It can very well be some kind of slide, sliding action inside the view. It all, it's all implementation details. What controller wants to know about is what are the inputs of this view and what are the output events. And if you know that this view extends this simple view MVC interface, and this simple view MVC interface is really the one that you will be using inside set content view method inside your activities. So it's not mandatory that activity actually inflates the view. What's mandatory is that activity somehow gets the root of the view hierarchy. And that's this method, get root view. Uh, who attended um, talk of Hannes and the cost, I think, on uh, MVI? Yesterday, I think, yeah, it was. Okay, so MVI is a very interesting concept, but when I watched the talk, the thing that most was most interesting to me is this simple um, helper class that they extracted, which they called, if I'm not mistaken, view bindings. So they kind of extracted it to make it unit testable and stuff. I did not really realize, uh, understand why. However, if you see this presentation now, 
you will clearly understand that they are on the path to this approach. If they will continue to iterate over that approach, they will come to this realization that they need this level of abstraction, which is basically encapsulate all the UI-related details. Okay, so what are the advantages? Because let's be pragmatic. I don't want to write any code at all if I don't have clear advantages for me. Okay, so first of all, that's your way to actually decoupling the UI. You can take this UI and you can outsource its development and outsourcing is just one simple example, right? Because if it can be outsourced easily, it means that, for example, new team member can be ramped up on the same code more rapidly. So you onboard new developer and you can tell, tell him, well, you know what? We have this very complex application, very huge business logic, and we have zero documentation because we do agile and we don't need documentation at all. But you know what? We have these view classes and we have project, product manager and designers produce those requirements in form of a mockups. So please go and implement some requirements. And this way you can onboard new developers on very complex projects in almost no time. You will not be able to reuse uh, the logic that you put inside activity, activities. Activities are not composable. You cannot have one activity inside another activity. However, you can easily have one view inside another view. And you can, in uh, the view that you use in one activity, you can use in another activity, or in fragment, or as we will see later, just now, inside your list view. Okay, who coded Android before view holder? Who remember? Who remembers when view holder was introduced? Well, pretty much. Okay, cool. So just a short history. We used to use uh, list views just as is, and on each binding of a new view hierarchy to an element, we were actually searching for all the child views inside this element, but then we discovered that it is not efficient enough. So we had to introduce this view holder hack. Okay, let's call it what it is. It's a hack in order to avoid searching for entire view hierarchy each time we need to rebind the data to some element. However, you will not need to do that if initially you would write all your UI inside view MVCs or view MVXs because that they already contain all the view hierarchy and you can use them. Okay, so reusability is that. And surely no one uses list view anymore. We all view, we all use recycles view. But, and you got this hack of view holder built into this API, so you cannot get rid of it anymore, unfortunately. But uh, you can make the implementation of recycles view more natural and cleaner. So you can still use, you know, view MVCs for each individual element inside the recycler view. And what it gives you is the same level of abstraction on all stages of your application. So you have view MVC for your entire UI, and you have view MVC for each individual component, and you will have view MVCs for each individual um, component inside your list view or recycler view. And of course, I need to tell you what the costs of this approach are. So it's different mental model. As I told you, it's different to switch gears and look at activity as a controller and not as a UI component. And it requires initial ramp up. And it will end up being more code. And for some reason, in Android development community, we are concerned and even I would say, um, very concerned about uh, removing boilerplate and reducing the amount of code that we need to write. And uh, I'm surprised by that because industry as a large uh, kind of rejected lines of code as any kind of valid metric for uh, performance, for effort, for cost, for anything basically except for magnitude estimation of the project. And even on the big scale, it doesn't matter if you have 100,000 lines of code or 90,000 lines of code. On these scales, 10,000 lines of code do not matter. What matters is that you have good abstractions and you have maintainable application that you can deal with specific decoupled parts of your application when you need to, that you don't need to deal with 
all the complexity of your projects. And it requires discipline. I thought several times about extracting all of this into some, some kind of a framework, but I don't believe that another framework of, on top of Android is the way to go. We just need to learn and to have a discipline. Okay, and you know, the elephant in the room, I throw another MVX on you. Okay, so now you have 10 different implementations and another one, and this month we will use Vasily's MVEs, MVC, MVX, whatever he calls it, right? And yes, honestly, in some way I do, and we do have very many MVX implementations already, and that's another one for you to consider. However, what I will tell you is that it dates back to 2010, when Ivan wrote his initial blog post, and it was augmented by Josh with his breakthrough in 2012, and then I added this view in VC abstraction in 2014. So it's the most major, the most time-tested, and the most battle-tested um, architectural pattern for developing on Android applications today. And it didn't stop there, okay, so this guy, Nitin, he kind of reiterated my ideas and wrote this blog post, so if you go and look for Android MVP, that will be one of your first results, search results in Google, and basically that's the same approach, and you will say, well, what MVC, MVP, MVX, what, what, how do you call that? Give it a name. No, I don't want to give it a name. I think that all these names are genuinely bad, and it doesn't matter how you call that. What I find is that sometimes people will talk about MVP and will actually talk about two different implementations. Or they will uh, argue heatedly about MVP is better than MVVM or something, and then you write it down, and then you will discover that they actually talked about the same thing. So nothing of this is defined, and it goes back to, the, to one of the first slides that neither model nor X are defined so you can always have your MV, and there are some letters of alphabet that are free for you to use, or you can use two letters, so we have already seen uh, MVPC and MVCVM. On, on, you can al also augment that with something else. And really, I kind of quit this um, bike shedding. I prefer to just call it MVX at this stage. Okay, so to summarize, Extracting your logic is the only way to make it really decoupled. And this MVX view is the natural abstraction for Android. And if you think about this, the fact that it would allow to, to prevent this view holder design pattern from being introduced in the first place is kind of a good indication that it's natural, that it's the way to go. Okay, and activity can take on its natural role, and it's mature and documented. Okay, so you have posts from 2010, probably about 15 posts and several reference implementations from me and from other bloggers that you can look at. Okay, what about fragments? We talked about activity. So I will need another 40 minutes for fragments. Or you can just go to this presentation, replace activity with fragment, reread it, and it will make total sense, okay? So when fragments were introduced, Google actually made a good job of making the fragments as similar as possible to activities. So fragments also got, got classes, also, has, uh, also have hundreds of, me of public methods, and everything applies to them. So uh, now, uh, shameless plug. I started to produce uh, Android development courses on Udemy. So if you are interested in the professional Android unit testing or dependency injection, you can use this code. And questions, do I have time? Yes, we do. Uh, yes, I do. Thank you for Yeah, I do have time. But first. Come on. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you.